Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is John Lazaro, and I am the Senior Media Relations Manager for the GBMC Healthcare System. Before we start, I want all of you to know that Dr. Chassar sends his regrets that he could not be on this call today. At this time, he is presenting a town hall for our employees. As most of our dedicated leaders and volunteers, we are excited to share with you where we are in the construction and design process of our campaign, The Promise Project. We are very fortunate to have the best team working on this. GBMC's Healthcare Systems Vice President of Support Services, Stacy McGreevy, is the project executive, along with the primary project lead, GBMC Capital Resource Manager, Russ Sadler. Both of them will be presenting to you today. They have an engaging presentation filled with the facts and renderings, so we will let them get started in just a few moments. However, there are some things we need to run quickly through with regards to logistics. First, if it's possible, please mute your microphones. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and we will address them after the presentation. On behalf of GBMC Healthcare, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank members of our community who serve on the GBMC Healthcare Board of Directors for their endorsement of the Promise Project. We would not have been able to move forward on this important expansion without their endorsement. We have already received such wonderful, wonderful support for this project. Our donors are incredibly special. Since we opened in 1965, you have been supporting us and continue to do so through this next, next big phase of our history. As you will hear in the presentation, this pandemic has changed a lot for us, but what hasn't changed is the community's commitment to our clinical and frontline staff. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this tremendous support. It means everything to us and our frontline staff. Thank you for indulging me the opportunity to acknowledge and thank you. Let's set the stage for today's presentation with a video overview of the Promise Project. When GBMC opened its doors in 1965, we began with a promise. To always keep patients as our top priority. Over the past five decades, we've evolved and grown to meet the advances in medicine, technology, and the changing needs of our community. We've now redesigned care for patients of our 12 advanced primary care practices, Gilcrest, and our hospital. It's time for the design of our facilities to match our redesigned care. The construction of new medicine units will double the room size for patients with serious illness. A family visiting area and state-of-the-art technology will be added into every room. Advanced soundproofing will ensure each patient can get the quiet rest they need. We'll extend our promise to the community, enhancing the patient experience with comfort, convenience, and the latest technology. Our new facility will feature a modern lobby, healing garden, and the Yvonne Callard Chapel that will offer a serene and beautiful environment. But we cannot do it alone.
As we grow, we need you, our grateful patients, our providers, our volunteers, our family, to partner with us so that we can provide the care we would want for our own loved ones to every patient, every time. We need your help to fulfill the Promise Project. Good afternoon. Welcome to the sneak preview of our work so far on the Promise Project. I also want to extend my sincere thank you to the community and board members for your support and generosity, because this project would not be possible without it. So first, I'm gonna set the stage by taking us back to our guiding principles, why we really started this project and what the foundation is. The first is that we wanted a welcoming and inviting, comfortable environment for our patients, families, and staff. Of course, safety is our primary concern. We also wanted spaces and design that could support our workflow. As you know, the space of today's rooms are well less than code. They do not provide the space and design that we need for the kind of care we provide with, with different uh, care providers in the rooms. Uh, we wanted a building that makes a statement and enhances the GBMC brand. Right now, we really don't have a welcoming main um, entrance into our GBMC hospital, and we wanted to create that statement. And lastly, and also very important, we want to integrate technology for today and tomorrow. Technology goes very quickly, and we want to be able to have our patients and staff have the tools they need. So now I'll get into the next slide. And just to take a minute to explain the four phases of our design and construction process. The first is our schematic design. So essentially that work has been done. That's where we talk to all of our stakeholders and come up with a concept to determine whether or not the schematic design, whether or not the things will fit into the room. And that work has been done, thanks to many, many people. We are now into what we call design development, and that work will be completed in October. At this point, we will have fully developed floor plans. We will have developed our exteriors and finishes, some of which we will show you today, and we'll confirm our final program. Our next step will be in January, where we complete our construction documents. Now, these will be the final specifications that will go to our builder, and we will break ground in the Promise Project this summer of 2021. So we are well on our way to keeping our time frame. Capital resources and GBMC. A project of this size requires a rather large design team. For us, establishing a design team took several months of bidding to architects, engineers, and program managers. Our goal was not just to have the best in those fields, but we wanted a group and a team that believed in our vision, believed in our mission, and we all put that to paper. As you see in front of you, it's a very complex tree of components to make this project work, but everything starts at our executive core team at the top. From there, it goes to the owner's rep, which in this case is myself. And my job is to make sure that everything underneath of that tree falls in line and gets the assistance they need to create the plans and put our vision on the paper. So what we build isn't just a typical hospital. It is something that represents the GVMC brand and the GVMC culture. So here you can see our original concept of the Promise Project. This is what we started with in the early beginnings. As the, as the design changed, it progressed in the, a little bit more refined renderings. Stacy will talk about the next slide, just how that process went. So you should see the rendering here. There we go. This is the uh, Promise Project rendering that we've come up with to date. And you can see here that we have a covered entrance for drop-off and pickup. 
a welcoming and inviting building that as you enter the campus. Next slide. Here you will see fully progression of our design. We refined the main entrance. We've added beautiful landscaping and we have made a provisions for Americans with Disabilities Act access. Next. Figure out our current and future state of GBMC. Establishing the current state will be for both the third floor main lobby and the clinical floors on four and five. The third floor was a one, one day current state process, which we looked at what exactly do we have on our main floor now? What do we need and what's missing? When we did a future state, we looked at the art of the possible. That was about a day and a half session that looked at everything we could throw into a main lobby. There was no limits on what the ideas were. It was simply throw out what you think it should have and we evaluated it. We had about 15 to 20 participants on that third floor. The clinical floors were a little more complex because this is truly the areas that impact the patient care areas. We spent about two days looking at the current state session. We looked at everything from how supplies are brought to the patient room to how many steps nursing takes from a nursing station to the room. We also looked at physician space and we looked at spaces that could provide an escape for patients if they want to just relax, if they want just to take in a minute. The future state for clinical floors was a two-day future state session, and this was a much larger group of 25 to 30 participants. As you're seeing in the next slide, we literally did copy and paste. So we lay out boards with pieces of a puzzle similar to a jigsaw puzzle, and the goal was how these things fit. Do we create zones? Do we look at everything from the path from an EVS worker from the supply closet to the room to the distance a patient may walk for a PT session. This process allowed us to create the zones for the, what we call the concept plan, which you see on this slide here. On the April 2019 plans, it was a concept of just establishing zones. This is the third floor, and it was what goes where and how does it relate to what's next to it. Over the next year plus, we create a design development plan, which you see on the right. The zones are similarly the same to what we originally thought they would be, but we learned a lot. We learned about distances. We learned from our community what was really important to that third floor. From this, we shifted down. As you see to the bottom right, there is a meditation space and a quiet space in what we call the spiritual zone, what we'll learn more about later. When you come into the main lobby, that was our big focal point of what do you see and where do you go? We looked to our volunteers who we graciously missed during this time of COVID and we can't wait to come back. And we also thought about the path going from entrance to end. If you look at the August 2020 plans on the upper left, there's actually a retail pharmacy, something that was not discussed during the original concept, but as design increased, we realized that this was a real need for the hospital and the community. Once we had these design development plans, we start looking at the flow of the building. How does it look? How does the floors look? How do the finishes look? I'll turn it over to Stacy, who will talk about how that impacted our atrium. Yes, yeah, so this next slide, there we go, is a, a picture of the atrium that we're going to add. If you look at the left side there, that is building four, where you're familiar with units 34, 44, 54. That's that existing building. To the right is the new building. So we thought a lot about how we could use this space. We thought about a garden and things like that, but ultimately we came up with a beautiful atrium concept. So utilizing a mixture of neutral and soft color tones, we've tried to create a warm and inviting atmosphere. And then to avoid the appearance of just a long hallway or ongoing space, the designers added movement along the floor and with the various floor types and patterns, as you can see so that the flooring acts as a guide to move visitors through the space. We're very, very gener uh, grateful rather to our donors because this space was mostly funded by donors. Um, it's very welcoming, has lots of light, and will have many seating areas. Um, so we're very grateful for those donations. This is a rendering of still in the, in the atrium, but it just shows you how the floor and the sides of the hallways sort of um, blend together to again, create a healing environment and define the space. Also on the third floor will be this, a state of the art conference center where we will use this space to offer 
services to our community. Uh, we're hoping to have wellness programs for our staff, visitors, patients, and our community, and it will be conveniently located toward the front of the hospital. The third floor will also house the new chapel and create better access for spiritual support. And Russ is going to give you a sneak preview into what the new chapel will look like. For the third floor, the Yvonne Collar Chapel was one of the most critical aspects of that third floor. We wanted to relocate the chapel but maintain the historical integrity and the value that it serves to our community. What you're seeing here is a view as you're walking down the atrium. You can clearly see the chapel, but it's back far enough from the atrium where it's not in a busy area and it provides you some quiet space in our what we're calling the spiritual zone. The most exciting part of this relocation was we we're allowed to now add outdoor elements to the chapel as you're seeing in the next slide. This is a plan view of the slide. If you look at the right side, you'll see a curved glass wall that goes to the outdoor meditation garden, which Stacy will discuss later in the presentation. What we want to do was relocate the existing stained glass to this outside wall to keep the historical value of the chapel, to provide some outdoor elements to give it some natural light to make it feel like a welcoming and inviting space. Our designers were able to take this and create this rendering, which shows that stained glass. So this is if you're in the chapel and you're now looking out at the meditation garden. As you can see, the stained glass is in the center of the glass with clear glass above and a frosted panel below. This provides privacy, but at the same time, makes you feel like you're capturing some of those outdoor elements that we graciously and so desperately need in a space like this. This is looking at the, if you're standing in front of the glass, looking at the entrance to the chapel, you'll notice we have additional stained glass on the back wall. This is also relocated from the existing chapel. Keeping with our warm and neutral color tones, we decided to use those in the chapel to create this open environment. The goal here was to create something warm, something spiritual, something that made you feel that you could relax and you could get a quiet moment to yourself. The chapel has been one of the most critical points of the third floor. Besides the chapel though, one of the biggest questions we've been getting have been, what are the food elements that will be offered in the new third floor main lobby? And Stacy will discuss those. So in this next slide, what you'll see is that we have a larger, more open food area uh, for our uh, food venue. We will have outside access from these areas. This will be lo located in the north end of the atrium. In addition, we're very excited and our volunteers are very excited that we will be uh, de designing a larger gift shop. That gift shop you will see there, if you look at the red arrow on your, on your slide, this is going to be uh, purposely located at the point where the new building and the existing building meet. And that is so we can um, you know, tie the new building with the current hospital. It will be a much larger gift shop and will be uh, run through our volunteer auxiliary as we are very grateful. The, this next slide that you see here, this is the north zone of the third floor. Um, you will see that the gift shop and the uh, food zone are at the top. Russ mentioned a retail pharmacy to the left. We're very excited about that pharmacy. Um, you all are familiar with uh, perhaps Walgreens that's on our campus right now. We will be doing our own retail uh, services in the new building. We're very excited about that. And then I discussed the conference center uh, area that was below the food venue. Here we're looking at the south zone of the building and you can see there um, the light blue at the top is our medical library which we will be relocating from the current space. Um, the meditation and quiet rooms are located uh, in the lower right there, the, the darker blue. So we're very excited because uh, one of the meditation rooms has been generously funded by a donor. Um, and that will be available to all uh, visitors, patients, staff. In addition, we'll have some additional wellness and meditation rooms, and each of them will have access to the outside gardens. So Russ is going to talk to you about the fourth and uh, fifth floor plans. Thanks, Stacy. So moving up to the clinical floors, we did the same exact process as we did the third. So on the left, you see our concept, and we knew we wanted to build two 30-bed patient units. But at that time, you know, we had to look at zones again of how do we reduce steps, how do we create efficiencies, and how do we really make this a unit that is 
you know, usable and that everybody can enjoy. And also gives a little bit of privacy in some areas of it for, the, for families that need it. On the right, as our plans develop, we kept our 30 patient rooms, but we also designed some respite areas at the bottom right-hand corner that overlook the gardens. We also created five team stations. This reduces the steps from a, from a clinician going from patient room to a nurse station where they need to discuss with you know, fellow nurses, fellow clinicians, and or just access to technology. So if you look at a unit layout, four and five are identical units. They consist of five team stations, three pneumatic tubes, two medication rooms, two nourishment rooms, and two isolation rooms. And the reason for these multiple rooms is we do not want a clinician walking from one end of the hallway all the way to the other to get to a medication room, to a nourishment room, or a pneumatic tube. Midway through design, something happened, which we are now aware of, and that would be COVID. COVID made us rethink how we were designing the floor. Thankfully, we were an opportunity where we could slow down design and think about future pandemics in healthcare. This enabled us to what we create called pandemic zone. So pandemic zone is a multi-zone unit that has negative air flexibility with multiple options on the floor. The floor can either go from a zone A, which is 16 negative rooms, or a zone B, which is 12, or the entire unit could be negative. The process allowed us to a simple modification to the rooms of doing anti-rooms and switching to HVAC where with a, literally a flick of a switch in a matter of minutes, the room can go from a standard patient room and start exhausting all air outside. So in less than 10 minutes, you now have 30 pandemic ready rooms per floor. Also looking at COVID, we realized we need some touch, touchless technology, some lessons learned, and Stacy will go into detail on those. Hi, Russ. So I, I think Russ really, really hit it, uh, the nail on the head there. From uh, COVID, we did learn a lot. Uh, we were in um, a mode here at the hospital where we needed to uh, take our current rooms and make them negative pressure so that they could handle isolation patients. And you know, luckily, we were able to do that uh, to do that redesign work during this time, so that we are ready uh, for any sort of pandemic in the future. Um, touchless technology is something that we're looking at. Um, we've been doing that around the hospital uh, currently, with the way that we wand our hands uh, to get through access doors. We're going to be looking at uh, voice recognition software, so that caregivers do not necessarily have to type on a computer. Um, and things of that nature. So we really did learn a lot and we'll be improving um, the way we provide care uh, with this new building. Now, Russ, we'll talk about our patient servers, which are another exciting opportunity under uh, that we learned from COVID. So speaking of changing how we do care, nowadays on a patient unit, you have one general supply room where materials management has to bring supplies in multiple times a day for the patient need. What we evaluated was that we could build custom for this unit and for GBMC is a patient server. A patient server is a cabinet with access from both the hallway and the patient room. This enables materials and supplies to load that patient cabinet up with the PAR levels required for that patient or that day or that week, and it allows clinicians to access it from the other side of the patient room. The benefit of this during COVID is if we have to go to a pandemic mode, all these patient servers can be quickly unloaded and then loaded up with what we consider pandemic required supplies in a matter of you know, minutes. Compared to now, we have to empty out an entire supply room and then resupply it as needed. The patient servers are something new to GBMC and something relatively new to healthcare. On these pictures here, you will see exactly how they look like. Each one is different because each patient server is designed for that need. Our clinical teams support services pharmacy, and various other departments all sat in very long meetings over a long period of time to design the perfect cabinet for us. These cabinets are custom for us, and one's actually being shipped here, which will be in our mock-up room. And even then, we'll have clinicians and support staff evaluate it to make sure we got it right. So besides the patient servers, there's also a matter of team stations. In a typical patient unit today, there's one central station that all clinicians and support staff meet at. 
We realized that this caused some noise issues for patients. It also involved a little bit of disorganization because everybody was trying to share a small space. In keeping with our zone focus, we really wanted stations that would divide the unit into zones and those assigned clinicians will work that zone. But they're far enough apart where it provides some privacy and some uh, quiet space for clinicians. The other benefit is, is that each of these zones will have the med room, supply room, and pneumatic tube right behind each team station. This reduces the steps needed to go from point A to point B. So once we had the team stations evaluated, this is a blow up of how they laid out. As you see behind them, there's your medication room, your nourishment room, and your clean supply room. So once we had this design, then we had to think about how's it going to look? Is it going to feel like a nurse station? Is it going to feel usable? And our first artist rendering was this. And this shows a very open area, but with some privacy. And then we progressed to let's add some color to the space. As you can see here, this is more of a finalized design document. And it really shows what it can look like. It shows the colors, it shows the lighting, it shows you know, how the nurses and physicians will interact with the patient rooms. The ability of the rendering here is that we can also modify this to make sure we get it right. So, the next process was mock-up rooms, which Stacy will discuss. It's one thing to have your designs on a one-dimensional piece of paper, but to really understand if the space is usable and really want the patient, what the patient and caregivers want, we did a mock-up room. So this is actually, we, we took a part of our, uh, the lit garage in the basement and literally did um, a mock-up of the nurse station, the room, a uh, med station, and the outside of a, of a room where the caregivers would sit. And again, this wasn't um, the construction team sitting in their offices and deciding what things would look like. We literally had 12 different tours that we uh, conducted. We had uh, 39 staff members, over 600 comments that we received from surveys, physicians. Um, we had volunteers, community members, et cetera go through the room and touch and feel and figure out exactly how that room would, would feel um, uh, and putting it from, pen, from paper to reality. And we got a lot of great feedback from that. It was really important. And Russ will take you through some of these pictures. Yeah, so here are a few photos of that design process. So we built a one-for-one -one scale room with real walls, real doors, and as you can see, we did some mock-up of cabinetry and doors, but this allowed us to see what did we miss on paper. A lot of times in our world, we put things on paper without being able to really walk through the space. This also taught us about some things we didn't think about, you know, as in the counters, are they too high, are they too wide? The mock-up's been revised numerous times, and shortly there will be a new mock-up built in the main hospital for public view that will be the reflection of everything we learned during this design process. So once mock-up was done, and we feel like we had the correct design, we start looking at the floor plan for the design. It's divided into three zones. On the right where the patient server is, that is what we're considering the, the clinician zone. The center is the patient zone, and we create this family zone to the left. This enables each person in the room to stay in their zone and with access to everything they need from the restroom to the door to leave. The patient server, again, allows the clinician to sit at a charting station, and if they need to access anything in that patient server for a patient need, it's quickly available. Once the mock-up was done and once we had our design done, we started thinking about colors, colors and floor patterns and how they impact the room. So this is the same mock-up, same patient room, but now we define those zones using simple floor patterns. The gray hatched area is the patient clinician zone. The hardwood area is the family zone. And in the restroom, we're actually using a non-slip epoxy resin fluorin, something new to GBMC, but something that will guarantee that we have the highest slip resistance for our patients. Okay. Sticking with the third floor theme of warm, neutral colors, we brought in a little bit of color to, to enhance the rooms, but we didn't want to go overboard. We want the building to flow together as one. This is a simple color palette for the fourth and fifth levels. The floors are the same in every unit, but the paint colors can change, which we're working with clinicians and the users of the unit to figure out what paint colors they feel are best for their unit. 
So this is an option that we show same exact room, just a darker blue color. And then we changed with a, a lighter blue color. And you can see it has a dramatic impact on the room. And this is our third option that gives it more of a purple tone, but creates a more warm and inviting color. All of these work with our color palette, as you can see here. This is another view of the patient room, defining you know, the zones that we spoke about, but just showing how those colors can tie into the outside elements of the GBMC campus. The outside elements of the campus were extremely important because for those of you who've been to our campus, know how beautiful it is. And our goal was to mix the outside elements with the inside of the building, not to clash, but to collaborate and accent each other. So site design. That was one of the most talked about topics we heard about. Where are the gardens? What's going to happen to parking? What's the exterior of the building going to look like? So as you see from this floor plan, the goal of the third floor was that every hallway has some type of visible natural light. The red lines showed a line of sight to the outside garden areas. So as you see, if, no matter where you're at, you have some type of access to see an outside visual. Um, Stacy is about to talk about a very hot topic that's been in discussion lately, which is the overall site plan, which not many of you have seen. So I'll go to that and let Stacy take over. Thank you, Ross. Yes. So on this slide, you will see this is an aerial view of the Promise Project. You can see there as it's labeled, that's the Promise Project, the new building that links onto building four. You see in, uh, to the left is the Rose parking lot, which will uh, be reduced in size because of the new building. However, it will be um, uh, appropriate for handicapped guests. And as we were thinking about this uh, Promise project and looking at parking overall on our campus, which I know is everyone's um, hot topic, and Russ has the privilege of running that department as well, um, we really took a hard look and said, you know, outside of the Promise Project, we need to do something about our capacity for parking. So what we have done, this has not been finally approved by the board or anything like that, but what Russ and I did with our architects and engineers is to develop a plan for a future potential parking garage. And you'll see it right there above uh, Rose. And the great thing about that will be that it will come out, um, it would be a... Um, three-story parking garage and would actually um, be uh, settled right on the third level so it could come right out to the front of the building. So we know we need parking. We know we need, we have aging facilities that exist right now, our Daffodil Garage um, and, and others that need to be rebuilt. Um, and also with that new building being so far up from the existing building, uh, we want to have access for our patients and visitors. Um, that enhances their uh, patient uh, parking experience. I also manage the parking operations at GBMC. So I'm a little biased when it comes to the design of how we do parking for this new facility. One of my main concern was the vehicle drop off and the entry landscaping. I wanted a vehicle drop off that was wide enough for multiple cars and improvement in what we have now. Also to allow for longer queuing lines, but we didn't want it to look like a long parking lot or aesthetically just look like a long road. So we start looking at our interior elements. As many of you will see these stone colors are very similar to what we have in the building. When I get to the next slide, you'll see how we incorporate that into these pavers which are outside of the drop off. If they look familiar, we try to replicate the color scheme that is in the main corridor of the hospital outside the chapel and Einstein's. So this will allow for a patient drop off, patient pickup. This will also allow for staff just to walk outside and get a breath of fresh air. Part of that is looking at our existing landscaping and incorporating some new landscaping that accents the building but does not stand out so bad that it just looks like it doesn't belong. Landscaping design was a huge part of this project. And when Stacy gets to soon, she'll talk about our gardens, which I'll go to the next slide to show a brief sample of it. So here you can see, I'm very excited to show, this is the chapel and court, courtyard garden plan. So this area is to the right side of the new building. Um, and you'll see below there is the existing building one or where our lab is, I'm sure you're familiar with that. And you can see the thing we're really excited about is that there are, the entire atrium has access to the outside. 
And we plan to make this garden very beautiful, a place for our patients and our visitors and staff to meditate, find spiritual support, and to find respite, especially with what we learned from COVID and our caregivers having to wear masks all day and not having the ability to kind of get outside and just get a breath of fresh air. So we're very serious about this work and making that a beautiful place. In addition, we could host uh, COVID friendly outside events in the future. So we're taking all that into consideration. Um, here you can see this is an, alar an enlargement of the chapel garden. And you can see that we're using water elements and private seating um, for reflection. And these are just um, some of the materials that we'll be using in, in that uh, fit out. The rendering of the chapel garden is still in design. So everything you see here in terms of that, that gold fence and things, those are not final. The, um, the site plan is and the, uh, the garden elements are pretty much finalized, but you can see there that what we want to create some sort of privacy from the rest of the campus with the outside um, chapel garden. Here you will see this is a rendering where we're, I'm actually sitting in the chapel garden and I can see the stained glass of the chapel that Russ talked about previously. And we're so happy that uh, the Yvonne Collard uh, Chapel will continue its naming and we will be able to take some of those beautiful pieces um, from the existing chapel to our new chapel. Here again, our potential um, water elements and seating. Um, this is looking down from where the um, existing main hospital is and kind of looking down uh, that path. One part, um, this is just an example of some of the plant palette that ties into our existing landscape. Um, and we'll also define the chapel garden as a separate area. As you know, we do a great job with our landscaping here and we will continue to make that a top priority for this new building. The courtyard will be accessible from all hallways inside the building. Um, so as I said, here is um, an opportunity for staff and patients to enjoy food outdoors um, and in the midst of beautiful shrubbery and, and um, a wonderful place for respite for our employees. This is another um, sort of aerial view of that courtyard. This is um, the chapel would be down uh, toward the bottom there. And here would be the different access ways that would lead you to the meditation rooms, to the food venues, um, and to some of the conference areas. And this is another rendering. This is looking um, at, if you're at the Presbyterian exit at the front of our current hospital, and you're looking outward, this is the, uh, the view you would see. To the left there is the existing building one, and to the right is the new building for the Promise Project. And so we're making use of that space in between the two buildings to build something wonderful. So that concludes our presentation. I hope you found that helpful. Um, obviously, Russ is the master construction mind, but I, I, uh, I'm excited to share this with you. Uh, we'll be providing more updates in the future, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions, John. I just want to thank you, Stacy and Russ. You guys did an excellent job with your presentation today. And, and really, I'm just so enthusiastic about the future of GBMC. And you guys did an excellent job in telling yeah. the public about that. Uh, we are going to get to our Q&A at this time. And we do have a question that came in. And I will leave it up to either Stacy or Russ to address it. And the question is, yeah. do you envision caregivers primarily in a core area or in the halls with mobile technology? Well, I'll take a stab, uh, Russ, if you would have. Um, so mobile technology, um, I, if I can answer that, we're not going to have the computers on wheels that we have now. The caregivers are going to be able to be in the rooms with the patient. Um, that's part of the reason we wanted these larger rooms is that currently today, we like to do what we call multidisciplinary rounds, where you will have care managers, pharmacists, social workers, docs, nurses, et cetera, with that patient and that patient's family. And currently, the, the size of the rooms today do not uh, allow for that kind of care. So we will be, the providers will be in the rooms with the patients. 
No, I think Stacy hit it right on the money there. That's pretty much exactly what's going to happen. Excellent. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. Um, when it comes to the Promise Project, if I'm not mistaken, we saw that the groundbreaking will be in the summer of 2021. I envision with everything that you just provided that it is all set and ready to, you know, once we break ground, we should be good and meeting our timelines. Yeah, so the, the, the great news is uh, we are right on schedule. The most recent big milestone that we hit was our certificate of need was approved. So essentially that gives us the authority to go ahead and get started. Um, and Russ has got a plan and I think we're gonna be right on, right on target. Yep, we should be on plan, great breaking ground next summer and it's about 24 month build. Our next question that comes in is, does the new room design protect patients or caregiver safety and health in an age of pandemics slash COVID? So I'll take a stab at that. So it absolutely does. Um, it's why we created that pandemic zone. And with those patient servers, it allows for supplies to be quickly accessed and changed out as needed. And these are state of the art rooms. So the negative zone has HEPA filtration. It has the correct air changes. Um, if there's another pandemic, and let's hope not, with a flick of a switch, these rooms will be fully capable of being pandemic mode and safe for patients and our providers. Yeah, I would I would agree with Russ. And I think um, as he talked about the nurse servers and the med rooms, the other thing that these rooms provide is that the supplies will be there on the floors when they're needed. The last thing we want is for a nurse or a caregiver to have to uh, go looking for what they need for supplies. And so with those nurse servers and those med rooms, um, that will also provide a more safe environment for our patients because the medicines and the supplies they need will be there. Stacy and Russ, this isn't a question, it's a comment that came in and somebody wanted to let you know that this was an exceptional presentation that you both uh, provided today. We do have another question and I'll let you uh, decide who wants to tackle it. Uh, the early renderings uh, showed the use of partial brick outside columns that mirrored the existing GBMC buildings. Um, was there a change there? Uh, yes, there was. Um, we did look at various options for the interior of the atrium, and I believe that's what we're speaking about. And what we realized is we have an older building with an older facade, and by code, we actually have to bring a lot of building four up the code which is replacing the glass, um, putting in a fire suppression system, a fire evacuation system. And a lot of that brick would not have survived the construction needed to bring it to be a co-compliant atrium. So we decided to do a facade over top of it. In addition, John, I think what I heard, Russ is absolutely <laughs> right on the atrium. An earlier rendition of the Promise Project, we did have brick on the outside. And yes, as we've gone through the development phase, um, that design did change as we wanted to can sort of modernize GBMC, keep the old with the new, um, but you know, keep the history with the brick, but also again create a statement for GBMC. And so many, many folks were involved in making that decision to um, to put that white facade on the front of the building. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question that came in is, as you can imagine, whenever you go to a, um, a hospital, it's always hard to find where you need to go. One of the problems or one of the situations, not just the GBMC, but just in general, has always been family and patients finding different places in the hospital uh, easily. Um, with the new building and the Promise Project, has this been addressed? That is a great question. And we're very excited to say yes. So obviously we will have signage and things as we move forward with the project. But we're currently working now with our um, IT team to uh, build a wayfinding app that will act very much like Google, where you will put in a destination, an address, a room, and that app will take, will give you directions uh, point by point to get to that location. So it's it's um, in process right now. We know that wayfinding is is a significant opportunity for improvement, and it is most certainly being addressed with this project. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, another question that just came in is if um, you can tell us uh, again what type of patients will be cared for in these new units. 
So uh, great question. These will be um, 60 new beds for medical patients. So we will be moving, for instance, in the, in the initial move, patients from units 48, uh, I'm sorry, 38 and 45 medical patients will be moving over to the new building. And then our plan is to go back to our very small rooms that you're familiar with on floors of 34, 35, et cetera, and making those rooms larger. So we're not adding additional beds, we are creating additional rooms and, and um, I'm, I'm sorry, creating bigger rooms for our patients. One of the things that we, we talk about is patient flow. So for this, will there be easy movement between units for medical emergencies? Yeah so, pa yeah, so patient flow has been a huge part of the design process. And that besides, um, you know, how do unit functions, patient flow has been one of the most difficult and challenging aspects of the design and one of the most um, longest parts of the design element. But yes, there will be easy access and we have thought about distances from existing units, distances from the OR, distances from the ER. So yes, there will be a, a quick access point. Thank you, Ross. A quick question, uh, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy about our medical campus in its current form is the the awesome gift shop that we have in the gift center and you mentioned during your presentation that it will um it will see some expansion underneath the new project can you talk a little bit about that expansion what maybe some new offerings will be uh, available in the gift shop um, in the future um well sure i i don't know exactly about the new offerings but um you know, we're even looking at things now very differently um, in retail with the pandemic. And so um, I, I think a lot of more technology and maybe some um, self checkout options, but surely we're going to keep the caliber of the types of items that we provide in our gift shop um, equal or better in the future. I guess the key thing there is that Carmen Beza, who is our director of volunteer services, is working closely with the volunteer auxiliary and we had members of the volunteers uh, auxiliary on our design team so that we, again, are not just coming up with um, haphazard plans, but there's been well thought out design in terms of this new gift shop. Thank you, Stacy. A uh, quick sure. question for the both of you. Uh, will this new building still feel like the GBMC we have all known to come and love? I think the answer is a resounding yes. Um, Absolutely. I think with the with the uh, the landscape design, the gardens, um, it's going to be an even better place. But the care and the experience that our patients will feel in these rooms, I think, will um, you know just take us to a whole new level. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Our our goal the whole time has been to marry the new with the existing without changing the culture and the feel of GBMC. And that's why we were so particular on our design team. We wanted a design team that, that understood the culture of GBMC and understood the importance of GBMC. And I, I think we have the best team for that project. And thank you, Russ. Um, again, I wanna encourage everyone who is watching um, or on the call today to please submit your questions um, into the segment that you um, can. Uh, if that's possible, so we can get to them because we only have a few more minutes. Uh, we did get some two questions in the meantime, Ross and Stacy. And the first question is, will the SICU and the MICU beds be moved for easier access between the ED and the OR? So the plan right now is not to move the NICU, I'm sorry, the MICU and SICU because they are, um, in great proximity to the ORs. Um, we will be adding, I guess, as we expand this uh, and, and complete this project, this will allow us the opportunity to expand our emergency department. So the emergency department will come out to where the front lobby is right now, which will make that more accessible to the MICU and SICU. But the plan to move those uh, units has not been identified at this point. However, we constantly update our master facility plan and look at the data and uh, you know get feedback from our from our um, providers and patients. But I think with the expansion of the ED, we will um, mitigate some of that uh, flow. 
Uh, this question is for either you or uh, Stacy or Russ. Uh, when will the mock space be available for the public? So our goal is to have the mock space available um, sometime before the holidays. So our goal right now is finding a location on the main floor where it's accessible. But um, the goal has always been to put this out there in the public for people to see, to, to really show GBMC's commitment to the community and to our promise to our patients to, to build a space that provides the best environment. Uh, Stacy and Russ, I'll, I'll let you, um, each one of you address this question. Uh, for you, since you guys are so close to this project, you know, if, if, if you were sitting across the, the, the dining room table with a family member, what would be the two biggest um, parts of this Promise project that you would want them to know um, about what is taking place? Shall I go first? You shall go first. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm really excited about the room size um, and not just because of um, uh, the modernization, which I'm excited about as well, but the fact that above all things, we are looking at the safety of our patients first and the way that we want to deliver care. And there's nothing worse than um, me getting a complaint from a family member that their loved one could not stay with them overnight because the room was too small. Um, and because I think it's very important for people to have their loved ones when they can available with them for, for, health, for health and healing. So that's, that's probably my number one. Ross, you have any thoughts? Yeah. Um, for me, it's definitely GBMC truly believes in the, in the voice of the customer and, and the voice of the staff. So, and I've been doing this a long time, and for this project and for all projects at GBMC, it, we are so unique in our culture that we reach out to everybody involved, from the support services to the clinicians to the pharmacy to e or EVS workers to our dietary departments. We really want everybody to be involved, and it's very rare and very special at GBMC to do that. So for me, it's just the amount of involvement that we have for this project. It's so unlike most organizations that I've been part of. You know, they really do want to hear the voice of the people who work here every day. It's not just my team sitting behind a desk making assumptions of how things work in the room. And that's the most critical and important thing to me is how much we care about what people actually do in this space. I think that's very well said, Russ. Great, great answers, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, I just want to segue into this. If you guys have about a minute each just to offer some last minute thoughts or maybe something that wasn't touched upon in the presentation to our viewers and listeners today. Stacy, I will let you go first. Oh, great. <laughs> well, I think what we've really learned is, um, I'm sure many of you know we are going through our Baldridge journey, which is about improvement and uh, gives us a framework for continuous improvement and um, redesigning care, which is our core competency. And this has been a wonderful experience. And as Russ said, listening to the voice of our customer and our customer our patients our customers our board members donors uh providers um you know you name it and we really did listen now not everybody's opinion you know had uh was able to be developed but i think the fact that um you know we had so many people actually feel in touch and get involved in, with this project it just amazes me and so i feel like I feel like it's our baby, our project, but I feel like everyone has such a vested interest because this is our community and this is where we receive our health care and where our families receive our health care. And so I think it's important that we really and truly think about how we want to provide the care for our own loved ones. And we do that by listening to what our community and, care and patients tell us. And I think this project is a very good example of how that really works. Russ? Uh, for me, you know, I've already spoken about the voice of our customer, our patients, but it's our leadership team that has really come together during this. Um, you know, to have a leadership team that supports the project as much as this, where, you know, we're not just leaders talking about a project. You know, the leaders are involved. They, they meet with the design team. They meet with the program managers. You know, they're, they're truly engaged in this product. And for me, it's, you know, having a leader like Stacy, where I can have these, you know, crazy ideas in the middle of the night when I can't sleep and I tell her my ideas and she doesn't kick me out of her office and she actually listens. And I think that's a, just a staple of leadership at GBMC is they really listen to what all staff say. And for me, for this project, I have learned that 
you know, all of our leaders think this way and everybody's engaged and our leadership team has just done a phenomenal job of supporting this project. And it's, once again, just like, you know, having our patients and our staff talk about a project, it's very rare to have every single leader support you on a project of this size. Stacey McGreevy, Russ Sadler, thank you very much for your great presentation <laughs> today and for this great information. Um, I'm, like I said, it's just someone who is watching it today and listening to the both of you. I'm excited, you know, about, yeah. about what the future holds. So, um, and I don't get excited too easily, but thank you very much to the both of you. Uh, this concludes today's presentation. Uh, but before we leave, I want to thank the members of our community who serve on our healthcare board for their support of the Promise Project. Also, thank you to the countless donors who have supported GBMC since day one. Some and for their support of the Promise Project as well. Please note that today's presentation has been recorded and it will be available for you to view in the near future. But before we end today's presentation, we would like to acknowledge our audience for your tremendous support during the pandemic, which has been meaningful to everyone, especially our frontline staff. On behalf of everyone today, I wanna to thank you again and I hope you have a great day.